Good day, everyone. I'm Colleen Campbell, and I coordinate the Open Access 2020 initiative. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this Charleston conference session, highlighting the different perspectives on what it will take to achieve a complete transition of scholarly publishing to open access. The fact that we have a sellout crowd of over 500 participants today is really testimony to the fact that our domain has acknowledged the transition underway and is actively seeking insights on how to navigate this transition and move forward. So let me introduce you to our three panelists who represent some of the key stakeholder groups in the OA transition. We have Ashley Farley, who is Program Officer of Knowledge and Research Services at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who will give us a perspective of a research funder. Uh, the Gates Foundation, as you might know, is one of the funders in the Coalition S, seeking to accelerate the OIA transition by aligning their policies, policies around the principles set out in Plan S. Stephen Barr, Managing Director of SAGE Publishing UK and President of SAGE International, will bring the perspective of a publisher. SAGE has, in fact, negotiated transformative read and publish agreements with a number of national library consortia in the UK and Europe, and an open access publishing agreement uh, with UNC Chapel Hill. So finally, for a library perspective, we have Elaine Westbrooks, who is Vice Provost for University Libraries and University Librarian of the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. When announcing that SAGE agreement last year, or earlier this year, um, or actually last year, Elaine stated, this agreement makes it easier for UNC Chapel Hill researchers to share the amazing work that happens here with a worldwide audience, and it is part of the university library's strategy to forge new channels for making published research more open and accessible. Now, our panelists will each make a brief presentation of their perspectives, and then hopefully we'll have some time at the end to get to some of the questions that you post in the meeting interface. So, Ashley, would you like to begin? Great, thank you. All right, so we've done introductions, and I want to make sure that we have plenty of time to uh, have a great discussion. So I, I don't want to take too much time in presenting, but I will hit at a very high level. And I wanted to make a couple disclaimers to start off. First, uh, I definitely come from a librarian perspective. I've worked in public and academic libraries my entire career, and now I'm at a um, pretty privileged research institution, so the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So I'd like to acknowledge that we've had uh, the ability to, to, to pay for, for open access, um, which not all funders or institutions are able to do. And I wanted to also cover that a lot of what I'm going to talk about is kind of what I think of, of hard truths um, that we don't discuss enough, but I still want to make sure that I'm doing that in a very respectful way. A lot of these uh, comments are pretty much over generalizations, um, knowing that not all publishers, organizations, funders um, may feel or agree with that, but it's, it's just a place to start discussions. And it's not meant to minimize anyone's work. Uh, but I do think that having kind of those tough and critical conversations will make the ecosystem uh, stronger and will help us reach all of our goals. So we talked, I think, a lot, uh, anyone kind of involved in, in uh, scholarly communications and open access, we have a lot of ecosystem pain points, and those are pretty well known, but I want to hopefully offer kind of a different viewpoint in my perspective of some of the big buckets that I have here, which is kind of the information overload, um, the proliferation of, of policies and, and coming from a funder that sets a, a policy. I, I um, am excited to talk about that. And then also, of course, you know, business models are something that we're always uh, talking about and kind of the crux of, of uh, I think, one of the obstacles to, to move forward in this space. I want to talk about preprints a little bit and, and kind of the information overload uh, buckets. So uh, they've definitely become critical in, in changing the ecosystem. And I think it's important to, to note how that kind of come about from, from a different perspective than I think we, we uh, typically talk about preprints. Um, I think the, the volume of them and the support of the research community has made it hard for them to be ignored by publishers, which does uh, show kind of the, the power that researchers and authors can hold in, in shaping this ecosystem. I do think it's kind of been a, a band-aid or work around the traditional uh, publishing models, and, and I'll talk a little bit about how the pandemic has highlighted that. 
And I think it's opened up a new world of, of showing the, the need for transparency in the peer review process and how many are motivated within the ecosystem to provide kind of open uh, peer review before it's even submitted for publication in a uh, traditional journal. And then again, you know, I know there's been a lot of discussions around linkages and uh, to other components of the research ecosystem, and that's added kind of to that uh, information overload. But these are all solvable problems, and I want to highlight that too. That just in general, we we can we can solve these problems, which is which is great. And kind of uh, the next bucket is proliferation of, of policies, and I think it's important to frame this. I, I think in a, in a way that's that's helpful in understanding this. So now we've seen that many funders are adding strong mandates around open access and, and uh, sharing of research outputs, which isn't something that we've typically seen in, in um, earlier uh, decades. Um, but because I think funders are now um, really focusing on the impact of the research outputs and, and, and not seeing a lot of change in um, the research knowledge ecosystem are, are now becoming more actively involved and, and pushing for change through um, policies. And that's why we're seeing a growth of that. Again, and that also ties to the shifting. So I think funders are starting to see that, you know, paying for uh, publications or ensuring open access is tied to their strategy and their mission in solving, you know, the world's toughest problems. And that's important. And then I know there's a lot of uh, kind of frustration around the fact that policies uh, differ uh, so much that there might be, you know, confusion among uh, researchers to which policy they need to comply with. And I think a lot of that kind of comes from, you know, compromise and, um, you know, funders really wanting to see quick change, but hearing from the community and addressing those those changes and making compromises. And that's uh, why there's kind of, there can be a lot of conflict in, in the policy. C space. Um, and then choice also com comes into it. And there's a lot of discussions that I've been a part of around, uh, you know, academic freedom. What does it mean to have a, have a, a mandate as a funder? Um, so those are, those are all comp important components as, as well. Uh, we've seen a removal of, of paywalls, so this kind of transitions into the business model. Uh, I think it's really important to take a look at what we've seen during the pandemic. We've seen, you know, increased um, from, of all research disciplines for those publishers that have taken down those paywalls. Uh, we've seen kind of an in, increase in, in speed, um, you know, whether it's through preprints or publishers uh, trying to speed up that traditional process, uh, we've seen a need to to uh, peer review and publish COVID research um, quickly, which I, which I think is changing the ecosystem for sure. Uh, I manage Gates Open Research, which is built off of F1000 technology at the foundation, and I think that is an excellent model to think about what does the future of academic publishing actually look like. I think we can get uh, fairly you know, bogged down in trying to flip the traditional system without thinking about what, what does the future of, of creating and sharing a knowledge artifact actually look like. And then we've also seen during the pandemic a, a I think, very strong um, need for transparency and things like open peer review, um, you know, uh, maybe not necessarily open data, but but definitely managed and shared data and understanding of that process um, is is become critical in being able to to trust the the research. Um, I like this this quote by Cameron Nalen. You know, if we think openness of communication is valuable within a crisis, it should surely well be valuable in normal times as well. And I think that's something that we should use to to frame how we we uh, shift our thinking moving forward. Uh, as mentioned, Gates Foundation is part of the Coalition S uh, uh, movement, and, and one of the major components of that work is, is getting kind of um, rid of the hybrid journal. And, and I know that that's, there's been kind of a lot of discussions within the research and, and scholarly communications uh, system, but we don't necessarily, I think, talk about why, uh, especially funders are are so keen to see this model um, truly shift towards openness as a default. Uh, you know, it's something that's been around for decades, and it hasn't um, made that full switch. Even though, yes, there is more more content, but I think this is that is being made open. But I think this is a great time to really uh, push for for faster progress tr towards full OA. Um, they're often more expensive. Uh, you know, we've been taking a deep dive into our APC spending at the foundation and um, have shared that data openly. 
and and have, have seen kind of you know that that hybrids are definitely uh, more more expensive to publish in. And then um, another component that I I have seen is kind of more error prone. So we get incorrect licenses. We can oftentimes have things that are paywalled. Uh, you know, mistakes happen. Totally get that. But uh, I think also to think from a reader's perspective, it's 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 completely unpredictable to know when an article is going to be open access or not, and you're going to hit you know different uh, paywalls for different content within those hybrid journals. I quickly and wanted to touch on, you know, of course, the other other um, issues that we know around, you know, faulty metrics. Um, that's a kind of, uh, you know, impact factor in this idea of prestige. And I truly believe we're going to have to uh, rethink or move past the highly selective journal model because it's just not sustainable uh, for the research ecosystem. And I think funders are really getting on board uh, to signal a shift of, you know, uh, you know, deciding what counts and what they look at. It's definitely been kind of a, a slow and difficult shift, but very important that funders are signaling that it really um, matters the the content and not the the venue of publication for for research. And really shifting to, you know, how as a researcher, um, are you collaborating and what is the impact of that work? And I think shifting to of just uh, counting certain outputs, but you know how does outreach and and mentorship and 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 shifting those things, and that's tied directly with the perverse incentives. And I think, you know, this is one one of the biggest barriers besides trying to come up with a biz, sustainable business model to pay for everything to be open. Um, there's still kind of that uh, you know behavioral and cultural shift that hasn't fully happened um, to get rid of those perverse incentive systems. And I think uh, there's been some great research being done on on uh, promotion review and tenure, but even if you know, I think things uh, start to shift and are explicitly stated, like we are looking for collaboration and openness as a funding entity. There's still going to be kind of a, a boogeyman um, feeling that that's not the case, and that the traditional uh, system of incentives will prevail. I uh, want to highlight really quickly some points around copyright that I would like to make. Um, I've been thinking a lot about this. So we, we of course, will we'll have the rights retention strategy. Um, we are an early adopter at, at Gates for that, which I think is, is making um, uh, an interesting change in, in really shifting and making sure that our authors retain sufficient copyright uh, to make their articles open access. And I just thinking, you know, kind of who owns what, um, you know, there's, there's been some estimate of, of, you know, how much volunteer time has been given for, for peer review, uh, the fact that research is funded by private or taxpayer funds, and then we can't access or build upon the research. These are all well-known arguments. I would say we've required a CC by license since 2015 and have a little evidence of misuse. Um, and then just the idea of like, that you have to pay more for some publishers for a CC by license and essentially, um, you know, an author submits their, their work and it's kind of, in my uh, bit of critical view is kind of held copy, or it's held hostage until either a copyright transfer is made or it's paid to be able to make it openly available. And I would definitely like to see that, that shift more towards openness. So what is the remedy of all this? And I have about a minute left. Um, so going to hit very high level um, and hope that we, we, we focus uh, more on the remedy and discussion. I think it really is going to be uh, community driven and community led. And I wanted to highlight, and there's a, you know, a, so many great groups to highlight. So I think it's important to focus on organizations that are already walking the talk. Um, it's been it's been done. Things have been tested, and and we should um, pay attention to those. And this is a an interesting conversation I had on Twitter. And I think this is um, a great thing to highlight that if we really want to make it happen, we're going to have to take risks, and we're going to just have to push forward. We're going to have to try and be agile. But if it's really part of your your mission, then you're going to find ways to make it happen. And I'm I'm very happy to to see and work with a lot of great partners that uh, have that viewpoint as well. And with that, I will stop talking and turn it back over to the group. Thank you so much, Ashley. Thank you very much, indeed. So, Stephen, I think you're going to share your perspective. No slides, just. You share. No slides. Yeah. No, I'm just going to talk. So, um, I mean, that's a great segue into some of the things I wanted to talk about. So, um, I'm going to start, I guess, by flagging. I think there are two sides to the the OA transition that we're uh, going into or going through. And so, um, there's the the obvious piece, which is um, the 
um, moving from an environment where uh, content used to be behind paywalls into one where content is openly accessible. But alongside that, there's the uh, systemic transformation of all of the practices and processes um, which sustain the scholarly communication process, how funding flows, uh, how money gets spent <clears throat> to support scholarly communication, and how to ensure um, the ongoing delivery of quality controlled research publishing outputs uh, as we move from a, um, a, a legacy subscription environment into a purely OA environment. So in terms of those two pieces, um, the, the piece which is just the sort of the absolute fact of um, the transformation that's going on in terms of moving to uh, an open access environment, um, I imagine quite a lot of people in the audience would have seen the work that Ashley and her colleagues published in Peer J in 2018, which showed that uh, at that time, 28% um, of all content <clears throat> could be found in some one open access model or another. Um, but actually that was distorted by the historic content, which was paywalled, and that of the newer content and the proportion which was available through some form of open access was up to about 45%. And that will only have been increasing subsequently. Um, so I think that the, the evidence is there that this transition is happening, that um, the scholarly communication process, at least for, with respect to um, journal articles, publishing research uh, in, in article form. So I mean, uh, different issues potentially applying to other kinds of publishing, but in terms of the, the journal's literature, I think that transition is underway. And we are, I can't give you an end date for when we will arrive at a, all the OA environment, but I think that process is now happening. So and then you move into the question of the transformation of the underpinnings of, of the scholarly communication process. So um, there's a, obviously a whole range of different models as to how people are uh, tran making that transition. So let's talk about a few of those. Um, so um, the first one would be the publication of gold open access journals. That's now a sort of well-proven model. Um, clearly works in an open access environment. There's no legacy subscription aspect to publishing a, a pure gold open access journals. Um, there are a couple of issues to flag around it. So um, uh, while that's clearly a model that's designed for the OA environment, um, does it work in all disciplines? So uh, does, is it a model that, is, it clearly works uh, very strongly in areas where there's a lot of research funding. So in Sage, we've, we've invested a lot in, in doing journal startups in gold open access models in both STM and in humanities and social sciences. What we found so far at this point is that, um, you know, there's a lot of demand for publishing in that form in the STM disciplines. There's a lot less demand for it as yet in humanities and social sciences. It's not too surprising because obviously a lot of the research funding is concentrated in, in STM and um, the people need the funding to support paying for APCs in gold, in gold OA journals. Um, but nonetheless, uh, that question is a fundamental one. Um, will that model apply universally? And then obviously there's the whole range of questions around um, you know, pricing uh, and different aspects of pricing in, in gold OA environment. Um, what's a fair price? Do APCs exclude authors from less wealthy environments? Um, what, what level of transparency on what you get for your price? All those kinds of questions. I don't have, I won't, there's too, too much detail to go into on, on all those issues here, but I think I would just flag that um, my own view is that uh, as and when we get into a wholly open access environment that the the way that environment will work will exert more downward pressure on pricing than what we have been used to in the traditional subscription models. <clears throat> and so um, I don't think that we will see, uh, and ultimately I think there will be a squeeze on publisher profitability in journal publishing in that environment. And so different people will have different, different stakeholders will have different views on whether that's a good thing or not. But I think that's my prediction as to what will actually happen. So um, obviously then there's a whole range of other models for um, uh, moving into open access environments. So you've got green OA, you've got subscribe to open, you've got transformative deals. Um, they're all positive steps. They're all, um, they all entail um, moving from um, a legacy subscription model into uh, versions of, of which do entail content being made open and available. Um, <coughs> In terms of the extent to which they 
answer that question as to what is a sustainable future for how <clears throat> how we will um, how the operation of the scholarly communication system will work in an open access model. I guess the transformative deals are the ones which have the most sort of clearly articulated version of that transfer that you you start from a read and publish deal which <clears throat> um, is basically based around the the uh, legacy subscription model, but you migrate forward into a publish and read arrangement, which is in which um, payments are attached to the output being published and, and, and the cost of, of publishing that output. So, um, so that all makes sense. And that is the transition that I think uh, needs to be gone through. Um, there are a couple of issues again, uh, in terms of uh, how do we make that work? So one of them is the one I've already mentioned. Uh, does it work for all disciplines? Um, do models based on paying to publish work for disciplines with less research funding? But alongside that, there's an issue which comes up a lot, which is around the change in the system that's entailed about moving to pay to publish, um, uh, concentrates the costs of, the, of, of supporting the system, changes who, who's paying for it. So the subscription system is based on reading. Reading is a fairly universal um, requirement and um, the costs of the subscription model are spread across lots and lots of universities in each country and across lots and lots of countries. Um, when you move to a pay to publish model, there's a potential for um, the costs of the system uh, to fall much more heavily on those people who are concentrating, the ones who are paying, who are doing the publishing. And so if effectively a risk that it concentrates down the costs to being falling on research intensive universities. So one of the impediments is the, the, the sort of tra transfers in terms of where the costs fall. So there are benefit beneficiaries um, in terms of less research intensive universities, which will be paying a lot less, um, but there are some universities which are potentially going to be paying a lot more. So, those are a couple of the issues that I think need to be um, addressed as we move this whole system into open access models. Uh, I think there are perfectly good answers to those. And I suppose my own picture of uh, a functioning open access future would be that um, there's, uh, uh, there's this fundamental division between um, funded research where the research funders would, as Ashley was just saying, um, would logically pay for publishing because it is uh, a part of the benefit of the, the investing in the research that they're, they're supporting. Um, and then on the other side, there's unfunded research and that the that would be the, res the research intensive universities would be where that's largely happening. And they would be redeploying the money they have traditionally spent on subscriptions and moving that over to spending on paying to publish. Uh, so, that's kind of one version of what I think that future might look like in terms of how the system would adapt to being a wholly open access model. So one consequence of that change would obviously be this thing that outside the research intensive universities, um, there would be potential for um, a major rebalancing, that there'd be a lot of reallocation, that the funds would be big savings outside the research intensive universities and potential for reallocating funds that have been traditionally spent on journal subscriptions to other purposes, supporting the, you know, enabling the library to buy other kinds of content and services to support the fundamental purposes of the university. So, so I guess my summary would be, um, there's still a lot of change we need to work through um, to arrive at a new set of practices underpinning open access publication scholarly research, but I think that journey is underway and gathering pace. Back to you, Colleen. Very well. Thank, thank you very much, Stephen. Now for a library perspective, Elaine. Great, thank you. Um, so I think I'll just kind of walk you through um, the Carolina pilot with SAGE just to give you some sense of what we've learned and some of the takeaways. And so the one thing I want to make clear is um, I'm really glad we went down this path with SAGE. Um, we selected SAGE as a partner because they're so open-minded, the, um, their willingness to partner. And I remember sitting down and talking to Stephen, I don't know if it was Cleveland somewhere, <laughs> somewhere. And then I met with Kathy Stevenson. So shout out to Kathy. Um, but you know, it was really a, a partnership. And I think this is what's different than my experience working with some other publishers um, 
is that, and also of course, Sage has a history of, of working in open access. So I, I'm really glad that we work with Sage and I could just, just to give you the, the um, overview, we launched the pilot of a transformative agreement in October of last year. And it didn't really start fully until January of this year. And the whole goal was to take um, about $160,000 of our subscription dollars to dedicate towards open access, right? And so um, just to give you a sense of Carolina, we were basically publishing about 300 titles a year in Sage journals. And we have roughly um, about 150 editors on our campus. So we're of course a high volume research institution. We have a $1.3 billion research enterprise. And so we thought that this was enough, you know, meat there <laughs> to, to kind of play around with a pilot and see what's going on. There's enough activity going on here. Um, there's certainly other institutions that are publishing more, but we thought this was a really good sample. And so, um, the other thing I want to be clear is that the um, APC was, um, is basically, we gave our Carolina authors a $500 discount, and so it's a $2,500 APC. And then um, we had to define what titles were included in the pilot. Uh, we knew we were going to have to test out some workflows. And then the other um, big value of this was that we had agreed to depositing the titles in our institutional repository. Um, so where are we now? Um, we actually are in a down year. And so instead of publishing um, as many, we thought we were gonna publish closer to uh, 200 titles and we're actually just hovering around um, 100 titles. And so we haven't spent the $160,000 that we allocated. We're basically at about $106,000. And we funded 42 open access titles. And I mean, the library has funded 42 open access titles. I'll break those numbers down. Um, we haven't been able to get the titles into our institutional repository yet because we're still working on those workflows. But I think it's really interesting. I had looked at the data in August and then I looked at it now. And um, I'm really glad I did that because um, our busiest months um, were July and October. And then, um, so last month we actually had about 11 um, accepted manuscripts and we funded all 11 of those. So, um, so it's definitely cook, picking up, but we're definitely not publishing at the level. And we of course apply this to the pandemic. Um, and so just to give you a sense of where we are, there were about 86 articles accepted. Five of them were funded by grants. So out of 86 titles, only five were funded by grants. Um, we, as the library, funded 42 of them. So 48% of the titles we were able to um, fund by, the library was able to fund it. Then the most interesting thing is 36 titles timed out. That means for 36 Carolina authors, they never responded to the email that they got. And so it just timed out. And when it times out, it says it becomes a rejection. So that's 41% actually, they just didn't respond to the email. <laughs> so we'll talk about communication a little bit later. And then of course we had some that were just outright rejected. They just didn't meet our criteria. Um, so when we look at all the numbers, um, we basically had about 65% of Carolina authors that were rejected because one, they didn't respond to the email or two, they didn't meet the criteria. And so fortunately we're able to go back and communicate with all those authors and say, hey, this is what's really going on. Um, you just, you didn't respond to the email. We're, we're gonna pay for this. This is gonna be great. And so we think when we go back, we're gonna be able to um, really um, get a lot of those authors to change their mind. Of course, we, we've been tracking the number one reason why people say they don't wanna publish um, their journal in open access. And it's, in most of these cases, I would say 99% of them it's because they don't understand that the library is willing to pay for it. And so they always say, I don't have the money. And we're saying, we, we know you don't have the money. We want to pay for it. And they still don't understand. And so that's something I'll talk about a little bit more. But um, I think our biggest takeaway is that we need more time to collect more data. We've only been doing this since January in the middle of a pandemic. So we need more data. Um, we need to see more of the data that SAGE 
generates. So Sage has um, taken it upon themselves to really develop the workflows and do all the lifting. And so we really appreciate it. But the downside of that is Sage gets all the data and we only get the data that Sage gives us. So we have to figure out a way, like how do we share more data um, across the, the publisher with the library so that we can make more informed decisions. I think the biggest surprise for us was the lack of trust. It's, it, it seems to me that predatory publishing has had a significant effect. And so the reason why 36 authors never responded to an email when I've talked to some of those authors, it's because they thought it was fake. They thought it was some scam. And so it's, I think it's that predatory publishing effect and that's what's keeping them from saying, hey, yeah, we definitely wanna do it. But what we found out is a lot of the authors who did um, actually use our funding, they called us first and they said, is this legit? And we said, yes, it's legit. And then they did it. So that was really a big surprise for us um, the other thing I want to make clear is grant funding is just not a factor. A lot of these titles are social sciences, but there's still a fair amount in health sciences, and I'm really surprised how few, we're talking about five, are actually being funded by a grant. So that's something we want to dig into a little bit more. Um, and um, the other thing that is really cool about this pilot is, is for the first time, the library is actually being inserted into this process. And so what's happening is Sage will contact the person and say, hey, your manuscript was accepted. Do you wanna make it open access? The library paid for it. And so I feel like the library gets this amazing goodwill. And then in some cases, the liaison librarian will reach out to the author and they'll have a conversation. And so I don't know how transformational that that interaction is, but I think it's something new. And I think we're, we want to get our authors more accustomed to seeing the libraries as not just the funder, but, but as a place that has expertise and can help. Um, so I wanna cover the challenges really quickly. Um, I've already alluded to this. And, and I think what's interesting is some of these problems are workflow problems and some of them are communication problems. But sometimes the communications is because of the workflow and the workflow is because of communication. And, and I say that because um, it's just hard to tell. And so, of course, we're competing for the attention of the scholar. And that's tough. Um, they, don't list, they don't answer emails from Sage. They don't answer emails from the library. So that's a challenge, of course. Um, I already mentioned the predatory publishing effect and this assumption that Anytime there's an offer to help or, or anytime there's a, a proactive communication, it must be fake. The other thing is that the amount of work that Sage is putting into this workflow is really intensive. And the work we're putting into it, I consider intensive manual work. That's something I'm not sure is sustainable. Um, the canned emails is part of the reason why they don't work. Faculty get them and they're just like, it looks like the same email that goes to, to 60 other people so they don't respond. Um, and this has really highlighted the, the idea that open access is just not well understood. The faculty don't understand how it works. Um, and if I were to talk about the next steps, we need to interview these authors more to find out what's motivating them to make their decisions. Because one thing, one number I didn't mention is 19 of them turned it down. And they turned it down, not because they didn't want it to be open access. They turned it down because they didn't think they had the money to pay for the open access. Um, we need to gather more data. As I mentioned, we're gonna go back to the 36 faculty members and who never responded and, and tell them that we're able to help them. And, um, and I think just in closing, I think we've learned a lot through this process. I'm still not, sure if this is the thing that we were looking for. And so I'm happy that um, by the end of the year, I'm sure we will get 64 titles in open access, 64 titles in our institution repository. But is this going to transform our entire system? I don't know. And if I had to do this with three other publishers, we it's just resource intensive. I don't know if we have the time and energy to do this kind of work with every kind of publisher. So I would just say that this has been an amazing opportunity. We wanna collect more data. We wanna keep the pilot going and then we can ask more questions afterwards.
Thank you. Thank you, Elaine, that's great. Wow, lots of good stuff in these presentations. We have um, about seven or eight minutes left to take a few questions. Um, before I do, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna go to question, but I'm gonna take uh, this chance to put a little plug in because you raised the issue of workflows and the author journey in, in publishing open access. I wanted to just mention that there's actually a session in about an hour um, pa a panel session that I'm actually participating in, organized by Lisa Hinchliffe, smoothing the smoothing the transition. So if you want to know more about workflows, go have a look at that session in the meantime. Okay, so we have some questions uh, that are posed in our chat. Um, and that's another question I had as well. Elaine, when you were talking about um, the articles, uh, you mentioned that you had 11 articles funded in October. And I, I also didn't catch specifically um, the money that's being invested in this. It, I mean, are, is this money that came on top or is this money from your subs from your former subscription spend that was converted to open access? If you could just answer that a little bit more. Sorry. So we are essentially paying about $320,000 in our subscription. And so we took 50% of that. So we took 160,000 and said, we're gonna dedicate this amount to open access. And, and basically we believe by the end of this year, we will be successful in converting 64 titles or $160,000 into open access. And that money has come from our subscriptions. Okay, okay, that's great, great. And another question, could I, oh, could sorry. I, could yeah, I add sorry. in? I think sorry. that the, the, you know, this is very much a pilot as Elaine's been saying, and, and there's a lot of learning going on. <clears throat> I think the objective on both sides was to achieve a much higher percentage of output from and this project in terms of OA, but without it being an incremental cost to UNC Chapel Hill. And so the, the piece which was, let's draw funds from the research funders and to be, um, a contributor to how we get all of this content published away is a critical part of the puzzle. And it's a bit disappointing so far that we, we don't seem to be mobilizing that. And so understanding why and what we can do to do that better will be a critical part of the pilot. Sure, sure. I know that um, we do have more cost. I know that in, in terms of author uptake, I mean, I know of transformative agreements in Europe that are looking at you know 90% and consortia not being satisfied with 90%. So um, I feel that pain that 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 you mentioned, Elaine, and, and certainly communication and workflows. That's absolutely um, what it's all about. Um, what about? I have another question here about the agreement itself and the money invested. And that is, what about the unspent funds that were designated for open access publishing? Are they going to? What happens to them? Are it, does it roll over? Are they recovered somehow? What, what happens there? There's no rollover, um, but essentially, I believe by the end of this year, we will spend up okay. 160,000. Like, I feel like based on the trends, we will have no problem getting there. And once we get there, um, we don't get additional monies, but I think we want to go back and look at the data and see um, if we want to, you know, talk to Sage and see what, if there's certain things that we want to change. Okay, great. Um, another question was, could you give us an example of some of the manual work you're having to do? Maybe on both sides, actually, but <laughs> publisher and library. And then uh, let's see if we got a question for Ashley then before we close things out. I'll go Stephen first. One of the things is that um, we initially wanted to help untenured faculty and graduate students. And so what would happen is Sage would do the communication and then they would tell us who the faculty member was. And then we would have to look up the faculty member to find out if they're tenured or if they're a graduate student. And so that's not a huge amount of work, but it's still work. And so now we need to say, okay, maybe we just need to skip this step, pay for everybody. You know, it's just one of those things where we were trying to be more equitable and that just led to a little more work. Okay. Yeah, I mean, on our side, it's basically around, obviously, um, this issue of involving the library in the, the, the pathway for research decisions and decisions for the institution to say, yes, we do want to spend our money on publishing this article. This is an article that comes from UNC Chapel Hill. It is an appropriate thing for us to allocate funds to. So it's setting up creating workflows that um, like, you know, alongside the normal publishing flows um, incorporate and the, the library into the process. So that's been the main, the main focus for us. That's, it's harder than it sounds. 
<laughs> and, and I can add a, a couple experiences from a funder perspective that's tied into this because I think uh, one of the the hardest parts for you know we have we have a central fund so it doesn't come out of the individual grant funds from the foundation again like, we were very privileged to kind of have that money we we've, we've spent over 20 million dollars in APCs uh since 2016 that's gotten us i think roughly around 8000 articles so it's interesting to kind of assess like is that is that the best use of of that that funds um uh but it's it's also been very arduous to try and make payments for those. So it requires a lot of, again, that communications work. Uh, we are funding a project called the OA Switchboard. That's something that we hope can help uh, alleviate those, those pain points. And I think that's, that's kind of a, a critical component because at this point, all stakeholders are spending a lot of time and money and just trying to make the money flow and managing uh, these payments and then making the connections between, you know, what are the research outputs from this, you know, the research and who's paying for them, who's picking up the tab here. And it's almost like we're kind of creating our own work and issues and trying to put, move this forward. Um, and I did see a question in the chat that I'll look at really quick. So you mentioned that funders are changing yeah, the assessment uh, criteria. And can I share any of the key metrics Gates are looking at or planning to look at for research papers that you're paying to publish open access? Um, so I think in, in general, for at least for kind of how we're, you know, we are door signatories. We have been for a while now, but we've not really um, actualized that, that uh, those principles in a way that I would like to see. So we're, we're pushing, I think, forward more heavily on that, especially around investments in, in COVID, because that's uh, proving to be such a, a critical landscape for, for changing um, our practices. And so it's been a big opportunity there as far as just looking at, uh, you know, availability of outputs, um, definitely that kind of collaboration piece. So just demonstrating understanding of, of working with data sets from others and working, you know, globally, because that's what it's going to take uh, to change that. We also have been involved in the National Academy of Science. Um, I think it's uh, engineering and mathematics. So the NASM uh, Open Science Roundtable and, and using um, some of the projects coming out of there, such as uh, different nudge language that we can introduce into our uh, applications and, and grant reporting along the way to really uh, support and, and, and show our preference for the open practices versus kind of the traditional. Great, thank you. All right, we just literally have two minutes left. So I'm gonna ask my panelists if they want to just give us two parting words. Um, yes, to our participants here, who I, I believe are a lot of librarians, but also publishers as well, technology providers. So what, what's the next step? What, 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 do they need, what do we need to do next in, to make, in order to make open access uh, large scale a reality? Um, let's start at the end. Elaine, do you have? We need to educate our authors more. They just do not understand the benefits of it. And secondly, I want to say that I feel pretty confident that if we had not done this pilot, we would not have as many titles in open access. I mean, I'm, I'm, we've looked at the data from the previous years. It just would not have happened. So that's right. a plus. Yeah, great, great. Also great uh, the opportunity to have the conversation um, as well. Sure. Stephen, how about yourself? So I think recognize that it is a sort of whole system change and that um, basically it requires an enormous amount of collaboration and, and that includes obviously challenge and people pushing hard for, for change and so on but it is it's, it's not easy and but that isn't the reason why we don't all have to engage in undertaking all that transformation okay thank you and Ashley yeah I would say let's let's not focus so much on on the problems I think those have been well <laughs> investigated uh, but let's really think think towards the future and what does the future of knowledge dissemination look like and how can we start building that infrastructure and systems to make that happen um, and not get too bogged down in, in uh, trying to, to um, flip a, a traditional system that may not be fit for purpose anyways. Okay, great. Thank you. Great. That brings this session to a close. Um, please join me in thanking our panelists today. It's been wonderful to have you all. Um, Thank you also everyone here for your participation. And so signing off from here in Italy on behalf of OA 2020, you take care everybody. Thank, Thank you. you.
Thank you, everyone who attended.